Shalom, everyone. Shalom. I want to welcome everyone to King James Bible University. I'm Elder Michael Johnson, and today I'd, I'd like to apologize for we 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 didn't inspect the amount coming from out of the country that we did, but we have to move forward. And this is a re-taping of the same that we went through for where did white and other people come from. And so we're going to go through this teaching and we're going to get each part and we're going to go through it to get the understanding of this. So the answer to the question is still going to surprise many people. And what I'm saying in that is the answer has always been sitting right in front of you. But so many people ask the very question. Many of them have gotten it wrong. Why? Because they choose to use outside resources. This is one of the reasons they think helping them answer the question by using outside resources, which actually hurts them in a lot of ways, but we're going to see exactly how not to use it and to where we can get the exact information we want by not ever going outside the Bible to get the information in the answers that we actually asking. Where did white and other people come from as well as Israelites? This is what we need to understand. So to get that, your Hawashai, which is most people will call Jesus Christ, which you see in your Bible. But through this teaching, if you know Yahweh's real name, which is that's the name that was given, it could make sense to where we're just going to use that name throughout throughout this teaching because that's his birth given name, not the translated name that we use currently today. So through the rest of this teaching, this is the name that we will be using. But we got to remember that he never spoke openly. He always spoke. In open settings, he spoke in dark speeches. He spoke in riddles, parables, and as well as riddles to which people could not find out or understand the mysteries which he was speaking of the kingdom. In this, we're going to see to where he made this profound statement, and we're going to see this when we go to Matthew 13, and we're going to pick it up at verse 11, and we'll see some of that there. And he answered, and he said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Understand what that's saying. But to them it is not giving. This is clearly being defined. So the one that's given know the mystery lies directly in scripture. The one who will know the mysteries of the kingdom. But the most high searches the heart is where he places seal upon them to which it is given to. And to them that is not given to is not given to them. So most people ask, well, what about John 3.16? What about it? Because that will also be misinterpreted if you're not using the precepts in the Bible and making sure that Bible don't, is not contradicting somewhere else. So this statement would not be made, but it would say to the matter, it is not given to who? It's telling you right there. But to them it is not given. So God so loved the world is kind of you kind of making the contradiction of scripture but if we look also at ecclesiasticus or uh or Seric, 17 even clarifies this the same exact thing that, that, that we're speaking of go to Seric 17 pick it up at verse 8 it says he set his eyes upon their hearts he set his eyes upon their hearts to what so that he only possible for the for your ways to know the mysteries of the most high He's got to look upon your heart. Why? That he might show them the greatness of his works. So this is something that he looks upon your heart and to them it is given to what? To know that what the covenant that he made with both houses of who? Both houses of Israel and Judah, which is really just Israel, but we're going to see that later on in scripture. But he said to them, he gave them to glory in his marvelous acts forever that they might declare his works with understanding. So this covenant that was made for where they can know this great mystery is what? That's the question. And the question will always be answered, which he tells you right there. He, he, he sets his eyes upon their hearts. So let's go to Jeremiah 31 and pick it up at 31. It says, Behold, the day saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So he defining these two, 
but you're going to see how he's going to merge them into one because no matter what, he's only dealing with one with one nation. What? Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day which, uh, in the day, in the day that uh, they took, I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall, <coughs> excuse me, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with them. I will make with the house of Israel. And you see right here where he clearly making it clear that um, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, he's not seeing them as two houses. He's seeing them as one. And, it, and, it's, and it's perfectly understandable right here. I will make with the house of Israel, not with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, with the house of Israel. He's joining that in together. He don't see them as two. He see them as one. But when he's talking to him, he said, okay, I'm talking to you, Judah, and I'm talking to you, Israel. But you guys are all Israel. This is what he's saying. He said, after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law on their inward parts and write it upon their hearts. This is what he was saying all the time. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the law is upon your heart. So how many churches we know has been out there saying the law is done away with? Exactly. That's the point that I'm trying to make to you. Because many are going to say that the law is done away with, but the many will say you don't have to do anything anymore to, 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 to get in the kingdom. Even Israelites has the same problem where people, even Israelites telling uh, the King James, uh, the first and the sixth was white, which is a complete bold faced lie. You know, but this is a way that they can pull you away from the King James Bible, which was written to us and for us, for us to have instruction on how we can attain eternal life back to the most high. This is what it was written for. As we continue to prove this with yourself, study one part. Look at Deuteronomy 28, 68 makes it very clear and tell me who fits this description. Tell me who fits this description. Show me one other race of people that were enslaved once and again and again and taken away in ships and sold to an enemy for slave men and for slave women. Show me anyone else who fit that description of Deuteronomy 2868. And then it even tops it off and no man shall buy them out that slavery. Only one people can fit that description with that great detail. Only one. And we're going to look at that verse. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28, 68. We're going to look at this one. It says, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way thereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. So you're not going to see this land anymore. This He's taking you away in ships. He's done with it. He's had it. He's fed up. So he's going he gonna to take us into Egypt again, which is the house of bondage, which will reference Exodus 20 and 2. And by the way, thou that speak unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and they should be sold, and there ye should be sold to your enemies. To your enemies. And this enemies never change. Don't change from Genesis. Don't change in Revelation. It always will be enemies, period. For bond men and bond women, you're gonna be sold for slave men and slave women, and no man shall buy you. No man shall redeem you out of what you're going into at no time. Because you're gonna be with your enemy and nobody's gonna get you out of it. So the same as you see, uh some of the some of some of these past activists have went out there talking about, you know, we we looking for freedom and we looking for equality and all this. That's not happening. They throwing you little little, little snippets of just giving you some rights. But once they want to put the the the, uh, the, uh, the clamps down on you, it happens at all times. So your enemies are showing in scripture, where did it change? You'll never see a change. But don't get me wrong, you do have, or misquote me, don't, don't, don't think that you have other nations that treat people in a harsh way, because it's not true. You have some that are even better than your own brothers. And they have pure hearts, and they're truly trying to help the Israelite nations. You truly have people out there that's doing that. So, so don't get it mixed up that all all these these nations are evil because because that's not true. 
nations are evil, which we even have some in our nations, but nations are evil, but you also have people that are in those nations that are not evil. So I just want to make myself clear. But for example, we have Rahab. Rahab hid two Israelite spies for three days in her own place who put her own life in jeopardy and put her own life on, on the line for these Israelite spies. But what did the Most High do? The Most High pardoned her house from destruction. So what we're looking at, once they went through and they started destroying everything, everything in that house, by association, purely, they were saved. They, they, did, not, they did not see death. All she did is place the red scarlet in the window and they passed over her. They passed over that house. This is what we have to see. The Bible says no one will get you out of this bondage. No one. The only thing can get you out of this right now is the Most High. He is the only one who can redeem us out of this. Deuteronomy. 2846 his people is a sign and he makes this clear and it shall be upon thee upon who Israelites for a sign and a wonder and upon thy sea forever so it's gonna be upon thee for a sign and a wonder and upon thy seed forever this same sign in us was in Yahweh Shai example how do you know that you are part of the curse spoken of Deuteronomy 28? In fact, many that will seal will still fall because of one thing, purely disobedience. Purely just disobedience, you will fall. The Most High said, how many he even going to save? Let's see this over in Zechariah. 13 picking it up at verse 8 it shall come to pass that in all the land saith the Lord two parts therein shall be cut off and die hmm. but the third shall be left therein and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver as refined and try them as gold is tried now we have to understand now gold and tried impurity and, and part of what is talking about this prophecy here, this is why he said we got to be gold. Because right now you can go out there and buy 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold, but pure gold, you know, you really don't find. This is what he's talking about. He got to get those impurities, those the, the, these parts that don't belong to us, he had to get those out. He had to purge that out. That's why he's saying this finish this out and say they shall call on my name and I will hear them I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God now Isaiah prophesied and throw the wrench in this same mix which clarifying which you're gonna start clarifying this understanding about other nations first to them to know the truth and still continue to mix with other nations was one problem this is the breaking of the covenant after coming to the knowledge of the truth was just pure disobedience. And this went through this went through a monkey wrench in the whole thing. Let's look at Isaiah 8, and, and Isaiah gonna clarify this for us. It says, And the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand. So he was very he was very adamant and very strong on, 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 on this very subject. I and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying Shall ye not a confederacy? Understand. To all them whom the people shall say a confederacy. So all the people who want to make a confederacy, you say don't you don't you don't don't be doing it. Don't make a confederacy with them. Don't join up with them. Making a confederacy with them, and he already told you to, by doing what? By doing marriage, by doing, you know, many different things against your own people. See, so he said, neither fear their, their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify, separate the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. 
So this is making sure, hey, this is, this is who you need to be tied to. So verse 14, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel. See right there, it's still keeping them both, both houses of Israel. He's not even, he's not even addressing them as Judah. He is saying both houses of Israel. For a, for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Verse 15. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. So these are going to be taken. Why? Because they're not following the, the laws and the statutes of the Most High. Meaning they're not going to go into the kingdom. This is all this is saying. Verse 16. Bind up that testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Verse 17, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Verse 18, behold, in the children whom the Lord giveth are for a sign. Understand what he's saying here. See, he's making this very clear here. And we're going we're gonna to start that at verse 18. Behold, our, I and the children whom the Lord have given. I and the children. Yahweh shot and the children whom the Lord had who the Lord have given for a sign and for wonders of in Israel. Understand how he's saying that. I and the children. Yahweh is speaking of himself, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. So Yahweh who 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 the most high had given for a sign and a wonder that the most high dwelleth in in uh, Mount Zion this is really very deep on what Isaiah is, is, is saying and making a statement based on Deuteronomy 28, 46. Because he said this is going to be for a sign and a wonder. Same thing that, that, that Moses said in Deuteronomy 28, 46. And then for verse 68, who was given to? Moses. And what? Now when we look at, same thing, when we look at Matthew verse uh, uh, chapter 13 and 11, it says because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. He's making it very, very understandable. So when we go through here, it shouldn't be convoluted. It shouldn't be where we're trying to find other places to make everything fit within this here because he's being very distinct on who he's dealing with. Because everyone's still not going to be saved. Many uh, think this speaking to all nations and it's not. The scriptures of Yahweh shall state it, but to them it is not given. I don't know what part we don't understand here. When he's saying it's not given, it's not given to them. I don't care what you do, what you try to do, it's not given to them. The kingdom of heaven is to them. And the kingdom of heaven that's coming is not even created for every one of us. We're going to see that because we're going to see another uh, uh, conversation that the Most High had with one of his prophets that is spoken of in a, in um, in the Apocrypha, make it clearly known that most of the master of the preachers won't even tell you what's going on. They're selling you a lie and, and trying to make themselves comfortable here on this earth. But everyone is not going. This is this is this is I'm talking about scriptures. I'm talking about validates this constantly. We're going to look at 2nd Adrees, chapter 8. 2nd Adrees, chapter 8. Adrees now is profound here, which what we're going to be seeing here. And he answered, he answered me saying, The Most High have made the world for many. Understand, he made the world for many, but the world to come for few. So, right now, the world he made right here for many nations of people right now but the world to come is made for few this is why Yahweh even said right here in Matthew 7 13 enter ye in, uh, in at the straight gate wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in threat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that shall find it. That find it. 
So this makes it pretty clear. But what these preachers like to do in some of these mega churches, small churches, medium sized churches, what they do, they do what's thinking that's what that was according to their pocketbooks and their jets and their cars and their houses. This is what they do. Leading you down the path of false doctrine, which just all you're doing is patting their pocketbooks. So they have put this whole false movement forward. And this movement is being, being going even more and more. But this same movement that we're talking about with the Most High has been going on for over 3,000 years. So this is something we need to understand. Now you got these same preachers calling and asking for tithes and, and donations and everything else. And you don't even see nowhere where, where Christ asks for anything for them to be doing that. These are preachers' inventions. This is what they call it. These are higher preachers' inventions. And doing what? Saying verse 2. And I will tell you a similar to. He's going to tell you them, something that goes hand in hand. Adris. As when thou askest the earth, it shall say unto thee that it giveth much, move whereof wherein earth in verse, best vessel are made. But little dust that gold cometh of, even so is the course of this present world. What is it saying? Didn't he tell Abraham, if you reference uh, Genesis 20, 22, 17, he told Abraham his seed would be as the sands of the sea. So the similitude of our understanding are we are gold buried. So the Most High have to sift and swift through, through much dirt to find the pieces of gold that, that are going to be pure to extract from the dust of the ground. This isn't like a gold rush where you're just going to find nuggets behind nugget as most churches teach us. Oh, it's just, it, we, you know, we're all going no matter what. Gold is everywhere, and that's not true. That's why he says this. He's giving you a similitude of what's going to happen. Let very little dust that, that gold cometh of. Even so to the course of this present world. So even this present world, it's not much here. That's what he's saying. It is not much here. So the Most High has granted many the humanity of life. But few will be granted eternal substance of life. That's what he's saying. So verse 3 clears it. There be many created, as in people, but few shall be saved. Clear. Clear scripture. Idris is quoting from something Yahweh Shai uh, will quote in Matthew twenty two fourteen, For many are called, but few are chosen. I forgot. Yahweh Shai never quoted from the Apocrypha, right? You see here, that's another lie they like to actually bring up. So many of us are going to fall for that same false doctrine being preached. Same as they did back then. Many are truly good natured people in a sense of the matter. But the most high that is still wickedness. Think about it. Example. You, you, might, you might know many people that are truly good people in many, many different ways. Many different ways you're going to find people that's really cool with you. In really good natured people. But let's say let's say this one caveat. Let's say this person do not hold to the food laws. I'm talking they do a beautiful person, but they just don't hold to the food laws. Is this a bad person in your eyes? No. They go out, help feed people, they do all these things. Homeless, they do it. Do that make that a bad person? No. You sit there and think that's a, a great humanitarian. Is this a bad person in the eyes of the Most High? See, because what we see is one thing, but what do the how do the Most High see it? We're gonna let we're gonna let the Most High answer with this book. Let's go to Romans eight. We're gonna see what he says. But to be carnal minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What is he saying? 
so the same as I say, so what if a person eats swine's flesh or sea roaches, what I call them, crabs and shrimp, it's carnal minded, which is death. So no matter how we look at it, no matter how we flip it, no matter how we script it out, no matter how we repropose it, whatever, how did the Most High see it? The Most High is being carnal, which is death. He's making this clear. So if you're carnal-minded, it's death. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's sep complete separation from God. This is, this, is, this is what he's speaking of. So carnal in, uh, is enmity to the Most High, a separation. And you also become an enemy to the Most High because you're not subjected to the laws of the Most High. The small part is what you need to be cleared also. Neither indeed he can be when he goes through it. So when he says his enmity for it is not subject to the laws of God, to the law of God, neither indeed can be. All he's saying, neither can he change his laws. So even though you don't want to be subject to his laws, he cannot change those laws for you. This is what he's saying. He's not going to change these laws for you. Verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So no flesh can please the Most High, period. So if you're thinking you that you're out there special, you, me, anybody else, thinking we're the special people, the Most High laws were good and holy and offered for salvation. This is why the Gentiles, Japhet children, not no one else, Japhet children, seeing this, and as they went through and started going through our books and seeing how these books is written, they started changing them. Start putting their likeness. Start putting their images in our books because it was not written to them. The Most High clearly commanded us not to even do this in the book. Don't even make books and change it up like that. He made this clear. Let's go to, let's go to 1 Maccabees and, and watch them a witness where they, where they started doing this. And this is right in 1 Maccabees. It says, and when they laid open the book of the law, the book of the Most High Law, this is what it's talking about, wherein the heathen, this heathen, has sought to paint the likeness of their images. Now the heathen laid open the books of the law and began to put false belief systems created by the heathen, forefathers, a total lie. They used false images, statues to accomplish this plan to deceive everyone so the worshipers that worship the image of the false Christ mainly stayed in the belief system calling themselves these so-called Christians. So-called Christian, and I'm talking about, it, it really don't make any sense. How is a Christian calling, they call themselves a Christian and they literally volunteer calling themselves a stupid person, which is actually the meaning of Christian. And, and remember this, over time they like to change words. That's why you like to use the old time words in their meaning because their they meaning is not gonna change to our time. So we have to go back there to that time. That's the same thing. You can look up gay in this time. It's going to tell you homosexual. Gay back then mean happy. These are some of the things on how they even change to even make stuff fit for them to justify their behavior. What if Paul came back or one of the disciples came back and not there in time right now? They came back to life and came and walked our streets. How would you think they would see they going around, they saying Christian this and Christian that, Christian bookstore, Christian this. They'll probably fall over. Saying, you know, all these people call themselves stupid? Can you why do they call themselves stupid? Mad people. Why why did they this is what you would get? What's worse, the ones even following the doctrine, and the ones who was about the doctrine will even punish will 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 even be punished with them. That's doing it. So by heathens creating a false Christ, 
and push on the world, many has brought in into this false doctrine system of lies. Solomon himself, you know, he, he tells you about the prophecy of inventions of, of the heathen and, and, and they have taken these same books out of the apocrypha to where you wouldn't see it because it gives you so much information to bridge the old and, and the new together because that's really what it is. It's the bridge to get the understanding of all things. They removed it to where they can remove your, your information. But we're going to look at... Um, something else and we're going we're going we're going to find out what's going on cuz we're going to see what Solomon said let's go to wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 and understand what, what what Solomon said it said for which that made shall be punished together with with him that made it so the ones who are in the false doctrine you're going to be punished right with them no it doesn't matter 11 therefore even upon the idols of the gentiles shall there be a visitation because in the creature of God they are became become an abomination and stumbling block to the souls of men and a snare to them the snare to, to, to the feet of the unwise so the Gentiles Jeff had children not Ham children or Shem children remember even Esau is from the line of Shem so he's not a Gentile. So we, we can kill that right now. And we're going to start finding this a lot of this stuff out once we get this foundation down packed. So this is clearly came from Japheth the Gentiles. The defeat of the unwise. Verse 12. For devising of, of idols, which the beginning of spiritual fornication in the invention of them, the corruption of life. So devising of idols, forming, form a reputation. So men start making and start consecrating objects for worship. Pagan deities, idols, statue, images, carved wood, stone, gold, formed from metals, you know, gold and all these things. What by what? Fish, cross, etc. You know, this is spiritual fornication. Yeah, and he already told us don't do even do this. But we do it. And what people do now, they wear a cross to signify themselves, saying that they, they're affiliated with Christ. And this is not true. You're affiliating yourself with a false doctrine. So, we have these itching ears trying to make doctrine fit, fit our lifestyle, showing on the part of the religious symbols, and not making our lifestyle fit the scriptures. We got it all twisted around the wrong way. This is what many is worshiping is an idol. But here's what happened when they started breaking down it better, who's who. So once we start really getting into it and see who's who, we're going to see how long we're going to go and then we're going to get the understanding and hear what happened, which is why we're going to go through and start digging on who's who and we have to understand who they are. Let's pick this up at verse 15. And we're going to find out a little bit there. And it says, For a father afflicted with an untimely morning when he had when he had made an image of his son, taken away and honored, honored him as a God. So an uh, image of his child soon taken away. He was killed early. And now honored him as a God, which was then a dead man and delivered to those who were under the ceremonies and sacrifices. So, he's giving you this prophecy. What is this talking about? This is actually prophesying about Pope Alexander VI, a Gentile heathen born, um, Roderick Roger, the Pope, back in uh, August of 1492, until his death, he was one of the most controversial popes in the Renaissance period. Because he acknowledged, he acknowledged a pope, acknowledged fathering several children by his mistress and thought nothing about it. Now, Caesar Boger was the son who had the early death. Boger was also suspected, which you got to understand 
this family is really, I'm, I'm talking about they, they do some unreal stuff, but many crimes, including adultery, incest, sodomy, bribery, murder, and they was especially good at doing one thing, murder by arsenic poison. But you got to remember, these are, are is a Pope family. So Pope Alexander had an image made of his son, Caesar Boger, and now honor him as a god. Caesar Boger was just a dead man. That's all he was. Nothing more. Verse 16. Thus, in process of time, an ungodly custom grown strong was kept as a law, and grieving images were worshipped by the commandments of kings. Now, over time, this custom of honoring Pope, um, the Pope's son, Caesar Boger, it became an ungodly custom for them worshiping him. It became kept as a law. Not just back then, even today. One of the, one, one of the, one of the holidays, we have Christmas. It's a national holiday. And worship by the kings, presidents, and leaders of this world. Clearly all the saying. This is a prophecy that being fulfilled. Verse 17, whom men could not honor in the presence, in presence, because they dwelt far uh, far far off they took the counterfeit of the vintage from far and made an express image of a king whom they honored to the end that, that by this their forwardness they might flatter him that was absent as if they was present this is making literally no so this wasn't even allowed most times to be worshipped there, but there was a far off in Europe in the safety down down here. And the image that they had taken and made an image of it was Caesar Boger and taken from that homeland and taken here in the Americas. And now they they doing the same same identical thing. No difference. Absolutely no difference. Fulfilling this prophecy. Verse 18. As a singular diligence, the ossifier did help set to set the forward the ignorant to more superstition how the ossifier is speaking of nothing but a painter talking about michelangelo first painted the most common religious image used in deceiving the world today it is the picture of a blue eyes european with blonde hair who have meticulously claimed to be Christ Jesus. English term, they tried to claim him as Yahweh is what they were doing with this image of a European. Why? Because in Maccabees, what they do, they open up our books and change the likeness to them. To add what? To add more ignorance of people based on, on not even being able to match any description that is based purely in the Bible. So you have people like in the Catholic Church, most of them don't even read their Bible. But based on the ignorance of the people to the more superstition of what? Of false beliefs. This is what was going on. Verse 19. And he peradventure willing to please one in authority, forced all his skill to make the resemblance of the best fashion. So Michelangelo was the painter, meaning, and all it means, and he paraventured. All paraventured mean is perhaps. That's all he's saying. So, what it's saying here is, for he, perhaps willing. And if you're not sure about paraventure and what I'm giving you the translation of that, then just look it up, and you'll see exactly what it's saying. And it's telling you perhaps willing to please. One in authority. That's all it's saying. So he perhaps willing to please one in authority. For all his skills, I mean he 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 put serious work into this one. And I'm gonna give you some history on Michelangelo. Because the, the history on Michelangelo, one you know where he lived from 1475 to 1564, give or take a year, and was a sculptor a painter or architect he was widely considered 
to be one of the greatest artists of the Italian Renaissance period. Now that, you still have to rank him still as that. He was the one who painted the Last Supper during the Renaissance period. This came through him. He was arguably the greatest painter of all time. And, and the reason why I say he was the greatest painter of all time is what I'm about to say about him and why I hold that opinion. Because his work demonstrated a blend of physiological insight, physical re realism with the intensity never before seen. This is why I hold him at that and this is why I see that. Because he can make things and what he, what he mastered at is to make one believe the image that he paints is true. This is what he was, he mastered at this. So most people can paint an image and you can sit there, oh, it's, it's a nice image, but he can paint an image and it look true. They take great skills to do that. And he mastered that. And this is why he was so dangerous. His contemporaries also recognized him as an extraordinary talent. Michelangelo received, I'm talking about tons of commissions from some of the most wealthiest people and powerful men of his days. This is why perhaps he per-aventured. Per perhaps. That's why I say it's per Because some of these wealthy, powerful people, men may also include it, popes and other affiliates of the Catholic Church. And his resulting, he carefully tended to preserve the future generations and was able to view Michelangelo really genius of deceiving the world using image just images in his fashion and now viewed even his son as the son of Yah this is what Michelangelo did heathen but it gets deeper let's let's jump down to verse 14 let's go to uh, uh, 14 and, and, and finish some of this out so Solomon Fourth chapter 14, verse 20. It says, So the multitude of the Lord, by the grace and work, took him now for a God, which was little before, but honored as a man. So now millions of people are looking upon Caesar Boger as a God, which was little before, just a man. He was just Caesar Boger. That was it. Nothing more, nothing less. But this is... This is what they were able to do. Verse 21. And this was the occasion to deceive the world. For the man serving either calamity or by trinity did ascribe unto stones and stocks in the uncommutable name. What is this saying? To deceive the world either by causing them great and often damage or distress, a disaster or cruel or aggressive government of rule. Is all it's saying, which is basically a dictatorship. That's why that, that's why I'm saying in the way of saying it here. In verse when you look at verse 21, either by calamity or tragedy, that's all it, that's all it's saying. Or arbitrarily used in power to control forces, forcing the belief of anyone that's coming into contact with. So if you came into contact to them, this is what they're gonna force on you. And if you didn't go with it, they basically will kill you. This is what they did. Now if you didn't now if you didn't um want to believe you were killed to near or near death until you subsided and then end up saying you believe this will be God in the eyes and they wanted to be saved from death that's what they that's what they like to do so as you sitting there and they got this knife to your throat they're doing something you oh, oh I, I believe I believe this is what they were looking for so in the eyes of Christ they believe that this image was also assisting them in winning the wars against the Indians also, the purchasing of, of slaves that we was being sold by the Africans. See, they, they don't believe the lie where they went over there and they was hunting us and did. That's the biggest lie that, that, that ever been out. We was being sold to them. So this great country that they, that they speak of was built on what? It was built on a false god. And the building was built on the Israelite slaves. Forcing the Israelites as the Greeks did. No different. 
That's why you can't see the Greek captivity in a regular 66 Bible book. Because it's in the Apocrypha. They're taking it out. They don't want you to see that because the same cruelty that the Greeks did is the same cruelty that you receive today. So to disrespect our God is by ingesting swine's flesh. Why? Because this is one of the main things that they did. The Greeks made you do this. This is why they don't want you to see that today. Even worse, today they made us eat the guts of the swine. They, they, they made us eat the lowest part of that. If not, we were going to die or be killed off anyway. These are things we have to understand. And let's not get twisted up and, and, and understand. He said, you'll be sold to your enemy. And no man shall buy you out of this. Verse 22. It says, moreover, this was not enough for them. So this wasn't even enough for them. Because they, they, they had to do more. It was more they had to do. So not enough for them that they erred in the knowledge of God. So they erred in this knowledge. Because why? Because it's not given to them. But whereas they lived in great war of ignorance, so they lived in war of ignorance, those so great plagues called their peace. So they're going to call great plagues peace. So if that wasn't enough, that they didn't have the knowledge of God, when they read in the book, because it's not written upon their heart, so you're not going to get the knowledge, they lived in complete ignorance. Even calling great plagues peace. What did Egypt call them? Egypt knew what they were. But these heathens didn't even know, and they called in these plagues peace when they died. This we even see today. Some of the greatest plagues that comes out for our punishment and you see on other on other nations, we believe that's our peace. They believe we're going to heaven, and they swear put down they going to heaven for the evilness they have done to God's heritage. Clearly what they doing. And verse 23 For Willis they slew their children in sacrifices and used secret ceremonies for revelings of strange rites. This I'm talking about you have to stop so much because Solomon is giving you so much information. I can't go into real deep, deep, deep detail because it's, it's a lot we already going to be covering. But what he's telling you right here, they slew our children in sacrifices. Many of these back at, back down in the south, from baby from a couple of months old all the way up to two, three, four years old. Please Google this. Please look it up. Please check it and just look up Gator Babies. Please look that up. Many of you guys will be shocked. Many of you guys probably never even heard of Gator Babies. But you'll be shocked by how and what you'll see. What they did with these Israelite babies, they'll, they'll tie a rope, and they'll sometimes steal them. They'll take them away from the mothers and fathers. And, and back down in the south, what they do, they couldn't catch them big bull crocodiles. So most of the guys, some of them didn't have boats, so they couldn't go out there to catch them. So what they'll do... They want to get them big bulls right there up on shore. So what they'll do, they'll tie ropes around these babies' foot. And they'll put the baby on the edge of the bank. And the baby's splatting and crying and hollering. And who and who hears and who notices it? Those big bull crocs. They come up on shore, grab the baby. You already know the baby's dead from that point. And what those hunters are able to do, they're able to kill that crop. They didn't caught that big bull that they've been wanting. This is why you'll see even these, they, they sit there and they call them gator babies. You Please go look it up for yourself and you'll see this for yourself. They use these babies for this. And they didn't survive. Now the other part, the KKK hanging the Israelites doing their secret ceremonies. They took us. Hunger, do did different things for what? These were secret ceremonies. Not telling you what they was actually doing. But what's even worse is most people always look over uh, 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 rivelings. They look over that. 
See, and ribolines have a special meaning. If you look it up, it has these special meanings that, 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 that gives you all the information you want. Ribolines just meaning they take great pleasure. That's what they're saying. So it's saying, or made ribolines of strange rights. So they made great pleasure of strange rights in these acts that they committed. This is what they did. Why? Because they take some, some, of, some of the Israelite women, they'll rape them. Not only that, you had some homosexual men, they'll rape our men, children, and they'll never be traitor or disloyal or backstabbing them in comrades, even by adultery, even if they had to go to court about it. This is what they did. Better yet, let's, do, let's go down to 24. It says, they kept neither their lives nor marriages any longer undefiled. So they kept the lives of, of us, anything undefiled. But neither slew one another treacherously or grieved him by adultery. This is what we was going through and this is what many of us go through today. This is the problem that we have. So Yahweh is making the statement who is them? So when you look at John three sixteen, and it says, "For God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son." For whoever is He talking about? Everybody? No, but everybody will tell you He is. People use that scripture quite a bit, but we're going to look at why Hosha, what 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 Yahweh said, and we're going to find out exactly what Yahweh meant, because. John 3.16 is not saying what many people say it's saying. Let's go to John 17. Pick it up at verse 4. It says, I have glorified thee in the earth. We know clearly who's talking. I have finished the work which thou givest me, giveth me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So he want to come back with the Father before the world was, and he want to be back with him in the same habitation place. This is all he's saying. And he said, I have manifest, my, I manifest thy name unto the men which thou givest me out of the world. What is he saying? I have made known thy name. So he made that name known. Who? To these heathen people. Exactly who he's talking to. He had made known the name to these men, these Israelites, a lot of them who was being heathens, being, being Hellenists. He had made his name known to them and made it, made, made it back right. Doing what? Amos 3 and 1 and 2, Psalms 147, 19 and 20. Christ is clearing this up right there. In the world, and then what he says, Thine they were. So he's letting you know, Thine, these, these are, are yours. And thou givest them me. So he, so, so the Most High gave them him. And they have kept thy word. Now they, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me, we are of thee for verse 8 for I have given unto them the words which thou givest me and they have received them and have known surely that I come out from thee and they have believed that thou doest send me we see here we're as clear as day all through scripture so we have to understand exactly what is going on all day, but watch how you're going to kill John 3.16. Because John 3.16 is a true scripture, but he's not talking to everybody. This is the problem that most people like to put out there, but that's a false doctrine, because he's not talking to everybody. So verse 9, we're going to clear it up. He said, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. So... John 3.16 is, for God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. 
Yahweh is telling making this clear. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. This is the killer, and he's not praying for the Gentiles. This is what he is saying. He's not praying for them. He's praying for the Israelite people. For the Israelites are yours. This is what he's making clear. Verse 10, and all mine are thine, so all, all Christ is his, and all thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So he's glorified in them. So he made this clear. He's clearly not praying for the world, but for them that belong to the Most High. And who belong to the Most High? He tells you all the time. And now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thy own name those who has given me, that they may be one as we are. So he want us to come together as one body. And this is our problem. Because if we come together as one body, we can be a powerful people. And this is something that we're not doing. But he say he want us to come together as one, as he is one with the Father. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I kept. And none of them I lost. Now, right here, we got to understand something. See, because none he lost. He's saying he haven't lost none. But what most people say, hmm, okay, okay, well, see, right here, we got a contradiction in Scripture. How? We'll, we'll look at John 6, 65. And what John 6, 65 says, And he said, Therefore said unto you, that no man can come to me, come unto me, except it was given unto you of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So, is this a contradiction in the scripture? No, it's not. Because they was not given with him. They had those itching ears. They wanted to hear something good. But when they started getting those hard, those hard teachings, they, 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 cut, they cut loose of that. This is what this is, what this is saying. So, because he's saying none of them he lost, but the son of perdition that the scriptures may be fulfilled. So the crowd started cutting loose because those teachings started getting deeper. Verse 13, now I come, and now I, I now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they, have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 14, And I given them thy word, and thy world have hated them, because they are not of this world, as I am not of this world. He's making you just totally understand, he's not from here, as we are not from here. I pray that thou should have take them out, that they shouldn't take them out of the out of the world, that thou keepeth them from from the evil. So all he want to do, keep it from evil. So he's not saying just take them out, but but but, but keep them from evil, keep them from these, these 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 bad people. They are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Sanctify them, separate them. And that truth, in that word is truth. And what is he saying? He wanted to separate that truth. We're going right, going right back to Jeremiah 31, 13. Goes right back and hit it. He kills the theory on the John 3, 16. Everybody that he's speaking to in the nation of people. But as it said, as I keep saying, Matthew 13, 12, for it is written upon the art, and you're acting, and this we're going to watch. He said, so whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But to those who have not, from him shall be taken away, even he that hath. So what is this saying here? 
even if you have the seal on your heart and is obeying the commandments, he gives you to receive more in abundance. He's going to give you more fruit. But to those who have not the seal, no matter what you do, you cannot have it. It's going to be taken away. There's no agreement with you in the Most High. The, most, the agreement is between the Most High and the Israel. So, as I said again, it's no such thing as spiritual Israel. No, it's no such thing. The Most High got, so when people say, well, the Most High got rid of the people, that, that's the biggest lie that you ever see. Scripture don't even support that even, even that type of doctrine because you can't find spiritual Israel nowhere in there. But even the ones that have the seal, <clears throat> let me be clear, even the ones that have the seal and do not his commandments, what did Yahweh shall I say? He says to them, let's read it. He said, but whosoever have not, from him it should be taken away, even, it says, even that he hath. So if it wasn't given and you're not doing anything, it will be taken. He will remove his seal from you for disobedience. Now we're going to get down to some nitty-gritty some nitty -gritty things, and we're going to see what is actually going down in a lot of the things. So we have to go this long way a lot of times to where we can get solid understanding. Let's look at... Um, Verse 13, so he makes this perfectly clear. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand what? He spoke to them in parables from the beginning. He spoke to <clears throat> parables is, is, a, is being used as an object just to tell a simple story or to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. Now they also are called allegories. Allegories, which is a story, a poem, or a picture that reveal hidden meanings to them that have understanding of the speaker of the story that is being spoken. So all I'm saying, parables and allegories can be spoken openly in an open form, but to the ones who understand the meaning of the parable is the only ones who would know what the meaning is because they know the language which is being spoken. Why? Because it's upon their hearts. Mainly the one who has pre-given the understanding of the knowledge for the wisdom of the parabolic story, which is such as metaphors. But the same reason many will not have the understanding for teaching, even today, is being fulfilled, which is spoken of Yahweh Shai, which is in this verse. So if you notice, I never right now even went nowhere outside no book to give you any type of understanding or to try to explain anything to you. Because everything is right here. It's always right here, right in the book. <clears throat> Verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Elias, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. So he is proof of this prophecy because we're going to see what Elias says. See, because Elias is also, it's just, it's, he goes by Elias here and he calls him Elias and we just call him Isaiah. But it's actually Elias. And we're going to look at this in Isaiah 6 and 9. And he says, Go, and I tell this, this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, and perceive not. That's the fulfillment. So the parables are spoken in open sittings, as we keep saying. But the ones who understand who the message is to. Now, what would it be to bring out something that most people don't know? And that's what part of this teaching is about. So, as I'm saying, so what I'm about to get into right now, most people are not going to understand. Most people are going to find this controversial. Most people are going to have a problem with it, but it's not speaking against anyone. But we're going to have to go back to the beginning to get a full understanding on what I'm about to teach and what we're going to understand, where the white and other people come from. So remember, the Bible is written. Almost 85% of this Bible is allegorical meaning it constitutes mainly of allegories and parables, which is written to them that has his laws written upon their hearts. So for this very reason, most people will misunderstand scripture for, that, for just that alone. This is why you get angels having sex with humans. Angels, you know, is, is in conference with the Most High. 
and we see and we see the conference and you know he's calling meetings with this we get so many different doctrines you know he uh he placed the seed in mary we're gonna get all these kind of crazy doctrines based on what because they're not understanding the bible because the bible is 85 percent allegorical and most of the people read the bible in literal and you still have the literal understanding, but you got to look at it in allegorical to make sure you decipher him what, what it, what's going on. Because in allegorical, he could talk one sentence and it'd be completely literal. In that next sentence, he'll go allegorical. But if you understand him, you can get that. But most people don't. So you can go through, and because many of them won't have it. But we're going to stay on this subject because I can go up to a whole lot of things on that. But let's, but let's go into it, and we're going to get an understanding of what's going on. So we're going to go to Genesis 1, 26, and we're going to start getting an understanding. So it says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over all, and over the fowls of, of the air, and over the cattle of, of all over the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, what he's saying in a nutshell, that he said, let, let us make man in our image. Keep that in mind. After our likeness. So he's going he gonna, he gonna to look just like him. This man that, he, that they're going to create upon this earth. And he's going to have dominion over all the fish of the sea, over all the fowls of the air, over all the cattle and all the earth. And every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So this is where 99.999% of Bible teachers mess up. Right here. Why they mess up right here? Because we're going to completely break this down and, and we're going to shock many people. Because he created man in his image. After his likeness, even after we read it again, and it's tell you right there, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Clear. So, let's see what he looks like. Let's go to John 14. And you're going to see Philip even have the issue with this. See, and it says here, John 4 and 8. It says, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. So, Philip is clearly asking Yahweh, show him the Father, and they all must have been wondering this themselves. Because it says, and it will suffice us. But Yahweh, we reply something so clear so distinct in most people it just flies over your head we just overlook it we just completely overlooks this and we can't be looking over scripture and Yahweh I said unto him have I been so long time with you and yet has thou not known me Philip he that has seen me has seen the father clear or how they like to say crystal and how said thou then show us the father you seen him so the first part is not even clicking with most people yet but we're going to go through this because we're going to bring them all with us and we're going to see what the father looks like but yeah how was i said he looked like him so let's see. Let's go to Revelations 1. And we're going we're gonna to find out what's happening. His head and his hair was white as wool, as white as snow. And his eyes was as flame of fire. So his hair on his head and on his face was white as wool. So let's get some understanding on that of our hair description. It's categorized as woolly, kinky, nappy, spiral, and frequently being used even describing the natural Israelite today's texture hair types and recently however it even become common in the circles that apply numerical ga gating systems on human hair types based in the Israelite camps because some of them oh he got good hair but if it's woolly kinky nappy oh he got bad hair if it's spiral, sometimes curly, kind of like you have my hair, oh, he got good hair. Really? What that say up there? 
is white as wool. Wool. <laughs> That's your key. Doesn't matter what, your hair is still considered woolly. That's actually the point. Now verse 15. And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. Now what color is burned brass? What what color is anything burned? This is what he looks like. So the Most High made Yahweh Shai in the image of him, which he clarifies right here in, in, in Colossians 1 and 3. I give, I give thanks to Yahweh and the Father of our Lord. Yahweh Shai, praying always for you who is the image of the invisible God. Clear scripture. The firstborn of every creature. What part are we missing there? So his feet is like burned brass. His hair is woolly and kinky. Pretty clear in scripture that we're dealing with. Amos 3, 1 and 2. Tell you who we're dealing with. But now let's go over here to Genesis 1. And let's get some understanding. So God created man in his own image. In the image God created he, him. Male and female created he, them. So the Most High created man in his image to look like Yahweh Shai. Burn brass, woolly hair. So right here, so God created man in his own image. In the image God created he, him, male and female. Created he, them. So the Most High created man in his image to look like who? Yahweh Shai. So if he looked like Yahweh Shai, how did they look? Clear scripture. Like burning brass and hair is wool. But he created them both at the same time. He created male first and then female. He created he them. But what I'm about to say is going to change a whole lot of things. But we're going to see behind this other thing where they talk about this rib that's taken out of Adam to make this woman. And telling you right from the beginning what the Most High created both. Because he tells you this right here. He created both male and female. But we're going to make this, this, this real believer doctrine. We got to correct this. This we have to correct to make sure that we understand what's going on. And we're gonna stay, we're gonna make we're gonna we're gonna make these and go through this tick by tick. Let's go to Genesis 2.20 and pick it up. It says, And Adam gave name to all cattle and all fowl of the air, and every beast of the field, for Adam, but for Adam did not was not found a help meet for him. Verse 21, and the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and when he took one of his ribs, it closed up his flesh and stayed thereof. This is the part right here where most people actually mess up. And a couple of parts we need to look at. When he took a rib and closed up instead of, he's meaning Taha. That's all he's talking about. What does this mean? It means the same place. He's taking, taking Adam. That's all that actually is saying. So in the internal term, it means the body. So they're looking at it in the internal, in the literal term, saying, well, he took it from the body. And that's not what he's saying. He's using the allegorical term. This is what I'm saying. This is where people mess up. But the allegorical term is figurative. It actually means, which is speaking of means like a door. Taha. Check it. You check it, you're going to see exactly what I'm saying. But where we are going to check for ourselves is directly in Scripture. 
and make sure what coming from this elder is being correct because what we have to understand is one thing which statement with other people in the Bible for understanding the flesh and bone and what are you gonna get into we're gonna see what what, what happened because he tells you right there that he came from the flesh and bone so that's why he's gonna close up the flesh and, the, and what and why Adam says what he says but let's make sure Flesh and bone mean what it says, or do flesh and bone is meaning what the allegory term, what I'm telling you. Let's go to Genesis 29, verse 13, and let's, and let, let's weigh this together. It says, And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, understand, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embrace him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he, he did all this stuff and, and he told Laban all these things. What did he tell Laban? And Laban said to, sure, to him, surely thou art my bone and my flesh. <clears throat> and, abode, and he abode with him for a space of a month. So Laban told Jacob, surely thou art my bone and my flesh. Same as same as what we see for Adam saying. Jacob was from his own people. He's from Laban's sisters, which it tells you right here in Scripture. What did Adam say in Genesis two twenty three? And he said, "This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she should be called woman because she was taken out of man. She was taken out from there, from 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 his from his people. So you even have people talking about." The, uh, the Adam and Eve only ones on this earth doctrine. Why? Because this is what was taught to you. This is not being taken out of the side. You have never read Adam saying anything like that. Not taken out of his side. She was taken from amongst his people. Not as a heathen nation. But watch. Let's see another passage for this same understanding to make sure we have to have this understanding everywhere because if, if it's not, Scripture will be can totally confused. This is why we got to make sure. 2 Samuel 19, and it says, Ye are my brother, ye are my bone and my flesh, wherefore then are ye the last to bring back the king. This is clear. So either they were still taking sides out of and ribs out of people, clarifying this parabolic language and spoken of in Genesis 2.23, when Adam said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. If he did this mean, stated everywhere else in the Bible and not in these other place, this is total confusion, which we always know. Yahweh is not is not is not of confusion. We know this. He's not an author of confusion. So never nowhere knowing the statement, many do not know the King James Bible is actually a dictionary. Many don't even know this. Many don't even know it's a commentary. All built in the all right built right in the Bible. But so many are on their high horses believing the craziness and all kinds of other books to prove not the most high statement, but using other books to prove their own theology. a theory or an occurrence of what they feel that would happen. This is what they do besides going to scriptures. And not one time have you seen me even right now, even going outside the scripture to explain anything to you. The Bible explains itself. This is what we have to stay with. Let the Bible explain itself and we stay out the way. So let's recap this. The most high created man in his image and he blessed them and we're going to see in the next part in Genesis 28. Watch. And he blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, have children, and multiply many, and replenish to fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish over the sea. Now he's making them sovereign. He's making them the kings and, and, and the princes over the, over, over the fish of the sea kings over the fowls of the air 
kings over all over, over all, everything, living thing that moved upon the earth. So they kings over everything. This is what they're saying. And have dominion. You're gonna you're gonna rule over everything. That's what this that's what this verse is actually saying. So the most high is telling them to be fruitful, and he gave them dominion over everything. This is the same reason why the disciples asked Yahweh Shai the question about the kingdom. Because this is where they had it. They had everything from the beginning. He blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over everything. But watch what the disciples even asked Yahweh Shai. Let's look at Acts 1 and 6. It says, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again, restore again the kingdom to Israel? You see that? So, do we understand that what they're saying? Will that this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because Israel possessed the kingdom from the beginning. So the question everybody is asking, how did Adam split into these whites and other people? The reason being because they didn't come from Adam. This is the whole big, this is the big mystery that, that's to everybody. They didn't come from Adam. Only Israelites did. So now they sit there and say, well, how can we verify this? We're going to verify everything right in Scripture. This is why Yahweh was able to even trace back to Adam. From Matthew 1, 1 to 16 shows how Yahweh Shai, the book of the generations of Yahweh Shai, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In another part, there's a caveat. Why do you think they even like to use in a trashing our own forefathers? Ham. They take swine and they take the biggest part of it and they want to call it ham. Understand that. Abram's name was Abram. A B R A H. I mean A R A A R H I mean A B R A H M. But guess what? When you put that ham on there from Abram, you got ham. And what they tell you, they want to sell you ham. They actually making fun of Abram. But that's on a whole nother note. But we need to look at an important passage before moving forward to these other nations. Let's look at Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed, formed, F-O-R-M-E-D, E-D, we're going to get our understanding. From the dust of the ground and breatheth into his nostrils the breath of life. Understand what that is saying also. And man became a living soul. Now, this is, the, this is the issue where a lot of people still screw up. Form, one is ED. It's marking form from past tense. It's an English verb. The verb is such thing mainly used for past tense of a regularly speaking weak verb like judge, ED, denied, you already was denied that, ED, or dropped, ED. Past tense, something that already happened. So he formed man, past tense, from the dust of the ground past tense. But they'll tell you right here, this is what he created, which is a lie. So, the Most High formed man back in chapter 1, not here. And he also breathed his spirit in man and called Adam. It became a living soul. This is the reason the Most High said his spirit would not, would not always be with man, would all not always be with Adam's people, would not always be with Israelites. We're going to clarify this right there in Genesis 6 and 3. It says, And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Hmm. What is this? Question. 120 years. So where did he actually solidify this and made this actually happen? Well, all we got to do is go to Deuteronomy 34. And we'll look at his main one to where he spoke to him face to face. We're speaking directly of Moses. In Deuteronomy 34, 7, it says, And Moses was 120 years 
whole when he died. And I was not them. So it mean like he was not like Jacob then. When Jacob and them started getting older, they started losing sight. This wasn't going on with Moses. Neither his natural uh, force abated. So he was in good shape when he died at this age. You have to remember, he was still running up and down the mountain. These are things we have to think about. So with Jacob and Isaac, the Israelites was known, we have to remember, we were known for having long lives. So even you see a lot of that even in today's time, but we was always known for that. It even shocked Pharaoh who was taking care of um, who, uh, who had took in Joseph. It shocked even him. Once Joseph brought his father there and he knew that he was there, he was shocked to know the age of the father because he even questioned the father on it. He even questioned Israel, Jacob, the father on that. We're going to see that. Let's go to Genesis 47. We're going to see this. It says, And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? Man, how old are you, dude? So what he's telling man, man, how old are you? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are in hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of, of the years of my life been, and I have not attained until the days of the years of my life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So, the Most High started shortening our lifespan because of sin. Israelite mixing with heathens. And now we're going to see what happened. We was mixing with other nations. So when when they were uh, man created, Adam was created in the image of the Most High. So what about everyone else? This is the statement I made, and we need to back it up. How are you going to back it up? Because it shows you directly in Scripture. In the image was created all people. All people don't look like don't look like Adam. Because even the Most High, even how He created uh, Yahweh Shai. He was like burned brass. Woody hair. You don't see that in everybody. And he was created in his image. So if he created in his image, how are you going to validate this Adam and all people came from Adam? This is how. Because any other scripture is not going to be supported because it's talking about total nonsense. But we just seen in scripture that Yahweh Shai only created in the image of the Most High. When you look at Revelation 1, 14 and 15. So, who fits that description? You see the point, And I know you should see the point exactly what I'm saying. So, so again. We're going to go back to Genesis. The understanding. And the Bible speaks in parables. With hidden meanings. And simple stories and allegories as I keep saying. So, as why many people misinterpret the scriptures. These are simple stories used to illustrate moral and spiritual lessons for understanding. The allegory. What they like to use, for example, is props. Examples is such as trees, grass, herbs, bushes, water, sea, rivers, wind, insects, or even animals to illustrate the point that's being made. Which many is either nonsense or fables to others of stories. Sometime a poem is formed, never seeing the real picture and reveal the hidden truth meaning of them to understand what the author is actually saying. The most high is hearing, but, but guess what? It's not to understand. First, I'm going to show you the allegory. This is what we're going to look at first. And then all others come all others came, then I'm going to show you the actual meaning to get to directly out of scripture and the mystery being revealed. Here it is. And God said, let, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs yielding seed and fruit trees, yielding fruit after his kind, and whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herbs yielding seed after his kind, and the trees yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now this was not blessed. But this, well, why is it putting so much emphasis on grass? Why is it putting so much emphasis on it? And then it even, it even um, saying his kind, his kind. 
we need to understand with that his kind. You gonna call it tree or his, a grass or his? That don't even make sense. Why are you putting so much emphasis on it? And the grass wasn't even blessed. The allegory that it was giving you, these are people. That's why most people miss it. Because this is an allegory. As I keep telling most people, the Bible is an allegory in most cases. So we're going to validate this to make sure that this is people. Let's go to Isaiah 40. And let's look at this. Isaiah 40, picking it up at verse 6. And the voice said, Cry, and, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof, as, as in the, fo the flower of the field, the grass weathereth, the flower faded, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. So all flesh is grass, and the flower speaking of the children of Adam, no other nation, Peter repeats this same understanding to clarify it. The same exact understanding. Let's see, 1 Peter 124. For all flesh is grass. Clear. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass, and the grass withered, and the flower thereof fadeth away. So the most high bring forth the grass for the reason why they are saying to stay with your own nation and not mix with them. Let's be clear on this. The issue with the most high was in Genesis 6. And we're going to look at this issue because this is where the issue actually lay, lay that. Genesis 6, pick it up at verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them. Now this grass is talking about the earth for the people, and they were multiplying upon the earth. But the same as the day as yesterday, these daughters is what it's mainly talking about. So, so it's talking about these other people begin to multiply. Now, here's the issue. Verse 2, And the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took them wives which they, which, which they chose. So with this saying, the sons of God, the ones who he blew his spirit in, seen the women of the earth, pretty and attractive, and what did they do? They took them wives and started marrying them, all that they chose. This is where the problem is. This is what it's saying. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his days should be 120 years. This is where all this came from. And where did it start? It started in the garden. Because guess what? That's why he said man is also flesh. Why? He became flesh in the garden. Because he wasn't always flesh. But we're going to see this right in, right in here, Genesis 3. And when he became flesh. Genesis 3, verse 10, and he says, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and, and I hid myself. So, he heard a verse in the garden, and he since he was naked, so he hid himself. Naked from what? Sin. So, watch this key thing that's being said, which is another false doctrine that people say that they was eating something, but watch how he says this. And he said, who told thee thou wast naked? So, the first thing come out of Yahweh's mouth is, who told you? That's the first thing you hear. Who told you you was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree which thou commanded thee, and thou should have not eat? So, did he told me, did you, did you go talk to that tree and use it as meat? And seeing meat in this Bible and meat as we see in this day and time, we're talking about two different things. You can look all through scripture, meat in the Bible is talking about bread. And at today's time, meat is talking about flesh. And when you're talking about flesh in the Bible, it's talking about animals and, and things like that. But meat in the Bible is talking about bread. You see that all through Leviticus. But back to this here, he said, who told thee? So the most high proceeded to, to talk the knowledge did you eat that I commanded him not to eat? Not, 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 not to talk to these people. That they was naked. So, what happened? Let's go to Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and it shall bruise thy, his heel. 
So he's going to put enmity between the two seeds as part of believing which is spoken. Put an enmity between you and the Most High. But it even gets better. Watch. Genesis 3.21 And here is the problem. And Adam also and his wife did the Lord God made coats of skin and clothed them. Coats of skin. This is where we put on the sinful flesh. Right in this verse right here. We were created in the image of the Most High from the beginning, and now we've been clothed in sinful flesh to cover our sins. Allegorical. This is all we have to look. So the Most High sent Yahweh the same way to condemn flesh to sin in, in the flesh. This is what he came to do. We're going to see that. Let's look at Romans 8 and verse 3. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Yahweh shall was clothed in what? Flesh. The same as grass. Man without the spirit that was breathed in Adam. Adam was the first clothed in, in the image of God. He was light. That's what we are. And we're going to get an understanding on that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians and we're going to understand this. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Why? Because he breathed it in you. Makes it clear right there in Genesis 2.7. And if any man defile the temple of God, he shall God destroy and the temple of God is holy, which the temple is ye are. So, right here is making it pretty clear. So if you defile that temple, he will destroy it because of sin. Exactly what he says in Genesis 3 and 6 and 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not, all, not always strive with man, for he is also flesh. Making that clear. And what did he do? He made them coats of skin. Flesh. Why? Because we are children of light. First Thessalonians 5 and let's see. It says, Ye are children of light, and the children of day, ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. This is not a we are children of light. So we are scattered all over the world to where we can bring light to the world. All goes hand in hand. All goes hand in hand. Let's look at Matthew 5. Ye are children of the world. A city that sits on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Because who you are in the image in, you're in the image of him. But we're going to see an image of this light. Because some people say, oh no, that's just talking about metaphorically. But let's see, is this talking metaphorically or let's see, is it talking about literally? Let's go to Exodus 34. We're going to see this. It says, And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimonies in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that his skin in his face shone, shine. Basically, I'm just going to use shine because that's what all he's really saying. <clears throat> while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, his skin and his face shine. And, and, they, and they were afraid to come nigh to him. They were scared to come close to him because he's shining. <laughs> this don't even make sense to them. And Moses called unto them and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him and Moses talked with them. And afterwards, all the children of Israel came, came nigh, they came close, and gave them in commandments, and all the Lord has spoken, has spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And basically, most people don't know what Mount Sinai is, but it's called the mountain of sin. Basically, that's what that is. And until Moses have done speaking with them, 
he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went before the Lord, or went before Yahweh to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out and came out. He spake to the children of Israel, which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw his face of Moses, and the skin of Moses' face shined. And Moses put a veil upon his face again until he went to speak with him again. So went to speak with him. So his face shined, but his face, but his skin was like charcoal. And the same thing you can do with trees and barks and everything else. What color is coal? Coal is black. But you put some heat to it, you put that to it, it'll shine just like anything else. Same as you can go take a tree bark, burn it all up, and it can be black as day, burned up, and you think it won't even burn no more. And you can actually use that for coal. They do it all day now when they bar when people barbecue. They do that consistently today. Yahweh side face also did the same thing. Shined as the sun. This is what we're talking about. So black into the ground, but then act as hot coal, burn hotter than it did before. It's the same as they did that they, when the three children was in the was in the furnace. And they seen the fourth one. Same thing. While they was walking about. But let's look at Yahweh and let's see how he did. Let's look at Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Yahweh uh take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart. And when and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine. See, because that's how we was made. We wasn't clothed in this. And his face did shine, and his remnant was white as the light. So we was not made this way. But he had to clothe us in this because we, we are basically in sinful flesh. And that's why he says we battle with that. Our spirit battles with the skin because what our flesh want to want, want to sin, and our spirit don't want to. So we constantly have war with it because we don't it don't really go together. Basically, all this sin. So this is the problem, and this is what's going on. So once sin was clothed like so 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 we're clothed like like grass of the earth is everyone else. This is all this sin. Let's look at Luke, another part. It says, if then be not able to do that thing which thou least, which take though for thy for the rest, consider the lilies on how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. They and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What is it saying? He was not arrayed as as he's talking about like the like like, like the flesh. Of them, of then, Yahweh so clothed the grass. Understand what he's saying? He so clothed the grass, which the day of the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. So he cast these into the oven and let them know what, what exactly what he's saying all the time. So they were sitting there. And, and, and he clothed them, but he's going to cast them into the oven tomorrow. How much more will he clothe you, or you of little faith? He's telling you. He's making, he's making this clear. He said, and ye seek not what ye shall eat, or ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. So we don't need to be, we don't need to be, be wavering with him. But watch verse 30. For all these things... Do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So he know we have need of these things that to, that that to take care of the body, but the spiritual thing we have to still depend on what we're dealing with with him with. Verse thirty one, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we need to seek the kingdom of God, and He will supply all the things that you need. So we need to stop worrying about what the world is doing and other nations are doing. And we need to worry about what the Most High is doing. So, this is a question. So the Most High makes a statement, as he did, that he would cast all grass into the oven. Showing what he thinks and what he feels about other nations. 
See, this is this is this is this is really profound. He even saying it, and you see it right there in the New Testament. He says, "So this grass and most people they want to be considered as the grass. They don't want to be considered as these people." But he's taking a serious stand here. Let's look at Isaiah 40, because people don't even want to address these scriptures. 40 and 15. It says, "But all nations are as a drop of a bucket." And are counted as small dust for a balance. That's it. Behold, he taketh up the isles. Which the isles, why? He's talking about the isles of the Gentiles. That's why he's, he's naming it right there. Taking up the isles as very little thing. This is why he's dealing with them in that way. And all nations before him are, are as nothing. And they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Meaning they are nothing but a vapor fruitless human in, endure which why you see in, in Psalms 39 and 5 David says pretty much the same thing he said thou hast made my days as a half rev and my age is nothing before thee you know verily a man in his best state is altogether vanity so how is this seeing that all nation before him is vanity and nothing Adris makes this perfectly clear is another reason why they took the Apocrypha out of the Bible. Why? Because they do not want you to see these type of these, these type of scriptures the way you precept them together. Because it speaks very harsh into them, but it should be comforting to an Israelite. Let's look at 2nd Adris. 6.54. It says, After these, Adam also, whom thou madest Lord of all creatures. So, is saying also over the one he created in his image is, is is Lord over all creatures. Of him we 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 all in him come we all. And the people also of whom thou hast chosen. But watch how you gonna change this up. As this have I spoken before thee, O Lord, because thou hast made us the world for our sakes, the Israelites. 54, as for the people, for other people, which are come, also come from Adam, come of Adam. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna break that down and we're going to get that understanding on how they come from Adam. Because this is where most people are always going to mess up. Thou hast said, they are nothing, but be like unto spittle, as it's talking about over in Isaiah, and has likened the abundance of them that are a drop that falleth in a, from a vessel. Verse 57. And now, O Lord, behold, these heathens, which have ever been reputed as nothing, have begun to be lords over us, which they are right now, and to devour us. Why? Because they're doing they whatever they want to do killing you however they want to kill you they're killing you without a cause they will go through great measures to save their own and they go through no measure to do you in so this is why David says that and this is why he's going to make a profound statement when we go look at Psalms because he's going to talk about the same thing in Psalms 102 and 4 it says my heart is smitten and wither like grass. So you wither like the regular people. Why? So that I forgot that I forgot to eat my bread. He forgot to eat the very thing which its substance is, is holding on to God's laws. That's what he was doing. He, he wasn't holding on to God's laws. Why? Because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. So we're going to do some work and we get ready to get, we're going to go deep into this now. We're going to see exactly what's going on and see where did they come from and how did it and it all started with Noah's sons. Because once he did it away with the first time by by, by, by by flooding the earth, but then we have Noah's sons and something that happened there. So let's go once this flood and see what happened. Genesis 9, 27. It says, Yahweh shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now what's going on here? The Most High is going to deceive Japheth, as it is saying. See, because when you look at it in the Hebrew language, it tells you enlarge here is meaning right here is pathah. That's what it's saying here. 
meaning to deceive, to entice, or to persuade Japheth. It's not using the, 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 the Hebrew word recall. It's not using that one, which it actually means to widen or to enlarge. He's not using that. And we got to remember, Moses used both both words. He used recall and sometimes he used patha. He wasn't mixed up. And we got to remember, Moses was sitting down with Yahweh himself, getting the instructions and, and everything with the right. This is what we have to remember so we know it was, that everything was correct. So Moses wrote this from Genesis and all, all the way through Deuteronomy. And the verse is saying that the Most High will deceive Japheth and will be... Uh, and um, will be a nation and thinking that they are the chosen ones in the land of Shem as a chosen nation and Canaan will be a servant to them. Why Japheth? Why is it pinpointing Japheth? Because Japheth is the one that married outside the nation. This is why. Because what we just, well, like I told you from the beginning, Ham and Shem never been considered Gentiles or heathens. But watch this. Genesis 10.1 is going to make this clear. It says, Now these are the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them sons were born after the flood. So now this was after the flood. The sons of Japheth. That's the only one we're going to concentrate on. Then we're going to jump down to five. It says right here, And unto them sons were born, and the sons of Japheth was Gomer, Magi, Medi, Javan, and Tubal and Misha and Taris. Go down to verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands and everyone after his tongue and after their families in their nations. So we see there this is being very clear on who they were. These were clearly Gentiles. No one else was considered Gentiles. So we have to remember some people were saved by by, by association, not by righteousness. Same as you see with Lot's wife. They was being saved by, by association, not by righteousness. So in this case, Japheth married a non-Israelite, a Gentile, which is known as grass of the field, which he was violating this, um, this in three. So we're going to look at Isaiah 37, in 27 and we're going to see right here where, where it says and makes it really clear and we're going to get the total understanding of exactly what was going on all the time so right here at um Zechariah I mean at Isaiah 37, 27, it says, Therefore their inhabitants were very small, were, were, were small power, they were dismayed and confounded, and they were as grass of the field, as the green herb, as the grass of the housetops, and the corn blast before it be grown up. Now, the Gentiles, not nothing in the eyes of the Most High. Jeff had children, was also known as bastards, not a, you know, not just Gentiles, but but please remember, Ham children was never seen as them in Scripture being called Gentiles. We see Israelites being called Gentiles because they was acting like, you know, Israelites acting like Gentiles being Hellenists. But only Japheth children are actually Gentile, grass of the fields or bastards, meaning these are the ones that was mixed going into the Ark of Noah with Japheth which uh, makes Genesis uh, 6 and 2 very clear. The sons of God makes, saw the daughters of men that they was fair and they took them wives. This is what Japheth did. This is what Japheth saw and he was part of that. Japheth was one of the sons of God through Noah, but mixed with the line of the Gentile nations, not making himself pure. And so it also states that we're here in Zechariah 9 and 6, which also be, it says here, And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. So those bastards are Japheth children. Where's Ashdod? Ashdod is Tel Aviv, Israel today. You can even search it today and see it. The Bible also says a bastard would never dwell in the congregation of the Most High. Never. That means never. Never dwell in the, in, the, in the congregation of the Most High. 
Deuteronomy 23 and 2. A bastard should never enter into the congregation of the Lord, even in his tenth generation. He should not enter into the uh, congregation of the Lord. It makes it clear. It also kills John 3.16 again. As that today is Jerusalem or Israel. Japheth thinking, you know, right now they are children. They are the chosen children. Israel is living in the land, you know, is uh, living in the land right now that they think. But the Bible says this is complete blasphemy. This is what the Bible says. The ones that's over there right now saying that they are the children, this is complete blasphemy. Let's look at that. Revelations 2, 9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. It's speaking to the Israelite people. But thou art rich. Why? Your heritage. What you inherit, you cannot buy. You cannot purchase this. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. So he said, I know this. Don't don't worry about it. I know this. Because guess what? I'm deceiving them. I'm persuading them. This is what, because I'm condemning this in the flesh. And I need I need to pull all I can. I gotta get all I gotta get all this impurity right in one place where I can get rid of it all in one time. And I know, and so, so, so he says, so, and they say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So to understand who the sons of Japheth are is to know who they are today. So the only way we can know who they are is knowing who they are today. Let's see. Let's go to Genesis 10 and let's find this out. Okay, so the sons of Japheth, Gomer. Let's find out. The sons of Gomer. I mean, uh, Japheth, the son of Japheth, Gomer. They are the Celtic nation. This nation consists of Ireland, Scotland, Brittany, Wales, uh, Cornwall, and the Isles of Men. Isles of Men, which is also known simply man, as a self governing crown dependency, which uh, Irish see between, you know, the islands of Great Britain and Ireland. But get this, the head of state is Queen Elizabeth II. She holds the title of the Lord of Man. Go check and see. It's really shocking. And let's see. Now we're also in Magog. Magog today, modern day Scythians. They are a large group of Iranians who, are, who, are, who have some ancient Greek historians speak of Scythians who live in the Black Sea, which in the Caucasus Mountains. Caucasus Mountains. You remember people that used to like to use Caucasian, but this is in the Caucasus Mountains. The name of the mountain also should give you a pretty good hint on who they are dealing with all the time. Now, we have Medi. So, our uh, Medi, some people like to change it. So, Medi is the same thing. So, in the, this is the modern day Medes. They are your ancient Iranian people who lived in the area known as the Media in the northwestern Iran and who spoke mainly Median language. This is who they are. Now we come up with Javan. Javan are your modern day Greeks. These are the ones who did us in. Javan is serving in the Hebrew name in Greece and the Greek general, but Grecians is known as the Hellenist Jews. So that's all that's saying. And sometimes you see it as Yavan, which is you see Y A V A N, but it's Javan. And then um, in the English, but it's Yavan the way you see it in other places. Isolonian right, Greek race has been known as a Kojic name in the Eastern Mediterranean, near the east and beyond. Tarshish, Sicily, uh, Sicily in uh, in the 16s, you know, 46 identifies as a uh, in Spain, Kittim, modern Cyprus, uh, Dudanium, and you see all these references. You can look at that in First Chronicles one and seven. And um, they were mainly the West modern Turkey, between Cyprus and the, and the middle end of Greece. Now we also have in in Tubal. Tubal is your modern day Caucasian Iberia. Pretty much who they are. 
as a nation, as a tribe of the Black Sea, coast later known as the Greeks of Tiberiania. That's who these people are. And we have Meshach. These are your modern day Caucasian and Armenians, and additional Gorgarians. These are tradition, and they share the descent of Misha, Gorgorians, Tobar, and Togomar. This is who they share this with. And then we have last up is uh, Tyrish. Are your modern day uh, Thessinians? These are your sea people. This last son name of Japhet is otherwise known and really is unmentioned anywhere else in scripture, but they are sometimes associated with Tarshish and they are a group of sea people which basically was, was, was a confederacy of a naval group that helped terrorize the, um, the Egyptians in the Mediterranean around the 12, 1200 BC. These people were known as the haired colored people or red hair or blonde hair. This is how they was known. So, and what was they called again? And by these was the owl of the Gentiles, divided by their lands unto every after his language, after their families in their nations. These were the Gentiles in their locations. Ham children was never called Gentiles. This is the name of his of his wife, you know, you know, they, you know, you can see how he never called it anything of these, these these such names. So in closing, remember this. This is something that all we need to re, we always need to remember. And we're gonna go to Isaiah twenty eight nine. It says, "Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast." What is this saying? The knowledge of this Bible, as I said. This Bible is about 85 to 90 percent allegorical. We have people going through this book, doing it in a literal sense, which is incorrect. This is why you get angels having sex with people, coming down, having sex, and having meetings, and seeds being placed in Mary by God, and it's telling you that this is why you're going to always get all this confusion because they're not weaned from the milk and they're not drawn from the breast. Why? Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is the way we have to do and this is what we did to put all this together. We had to get all the precepts and then we had to go and get these lines in other places to put everything together to where you can get the understanding and some we had to get a little bit from here and we had to get a little bit from there to get this understanding of what we just went through. In Adris 8, and he tells you, For thou hast commanded out of the parts of the body that it is to say, out of the breast, milk is given. So it's out of the breast, some knowledge is given, which is the fruit of the breast, which is the commandments of God, that these things which is fashioned may be nourished for a time until thy de deposes it thy mercy. Thou hast brought it up thy righteousness and nourished in thy law and reformeth is in thy judgment. So he brought it up in righteousness, which is the law, and nourishes in the law. But most people like to do it in other ways. And all this adding up to what? Jeremiah 3.15 And I will give you pastors according to my heart and I will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So with that, I ask that you guys continue to stay in the Word and always to hold to precepts of Scripture and stop going to outside material, trying to get understandings. Because all your understandings lies in the Bible. Outside material would, would do nothing but confuse you. This is the problem in Scripture. This is the problem that most people will always have. This is why it always is always very smart and very I'm talking about stick to, if everything you can do, stay to what the Bible says. So with that, I say to each and every person, I say shalom.